Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining me again this Friday morning. I'm going to actually continue on with our conversation that we started last week about estates. Um, as if you didn't listen to last week, I'll just share with you that my mother-in-law, in fact, passed away last week. And uh, so we were talking about some of the things that we were taking care of prior to her passing. Um, I just wanted to share with you some of the things that I did this week after she has passed. Um, obviously, we had the funeral to plan and met with the funeral director and things along those lines. Um, but afterwards, now the funeral directors have taken on some roles themselves that can make it a little bit easier for those that are those of us that are left behind. For example, they do state that they reach out to Social Security if um, the deceased was collecting Social Security and let them know that they have passed. Um, they also take of ordering the death certificates. Um, but if you're not going through a traditional funeral home and you don't have a director who's going to help you with those things, you are going to have to address them yourself. So that was Social Security. And actually, I did make a follow-up phone call with them to make sure that they had received the information. Um, it gets a little tricky about when they issue the checks, what's coming in, if there's a need to refund a check, if it's just been issued, types of things. So you want to give them a call and let them know what's going on. In regard to the death certificates, at least in the state of Pennsylvania, which is where I am, you can actually go online and request death certificates to be issued. Um, I'm not really sure how that works because uh, obviously you have to have physician who signs off on it and you have to identify the cause of death and you would need things such as the uh, parents names where they were originally born um, what uh, industry they worked in some inf information there that I've never requested one before but I know that you have the ability to do that if that's what you cho choose to do um, Obviously, we also needed to reach out to family members and let them know of mom's passing. So, um, you know, just going through your book, social media has made many things easier from that standpoint. So uh, in my um, situation, what I did was I posted it on Facebook. If there were certain people that I wanted to make sure they fit, I would tag them on it. Um, we had a choice of putting the obituary in the newspaper or putting it in their digital format and the um, funeral home that we used actually did a digital format for us so we chose to do the printed in the newspaper and um, did the digital format through the nursing or through the funeral director now the other thing that actually you have to do is you have to let creditors know that she has passed so that you're collecting all unpaid bills and making sure that that's taken care of. Now with the funeral director, they are going to ask you how many death certificates that you need. And I was kind of taken back by this. They actually charge in the state of Pennsylvania $20 per death certificate. Now I had already, uh, accounted for how many accounts she had and how many insurance policies she had. So I was able to give him a good number. If you have no idea if they have a lot of accounts, the deceased has a lot of accounts or um, you might need a, a number of them, I would start at a minimum of 10. But if you have an idea that there are a number of uh, insurance policies, retirement plans, checking accounts, those types of things, you want to get as many as you might need. It is easier to order them up front. If you have to go online and order them later, at least the state of Pennsylvania charges you another $10 to process them on top of the $20 to collect or to have them issued. So just wanted to make you aware of that. Also, sometimes a deceased may leave what they call a testamentary letter or one of those open this envelope upon my death type of situation. And that's something that you would want to do sooner than later. In that testamentary letter, they may outline for you some of their desires and wishes when it comes to a funeral or a service. And those are things that you don't necessarily put into a will because they're not something that needs to be followed from a legal standpoint. The other thing you want to double check is if they have signed up to be an organ donor. 
That can be outlined on their driver's license. It might be in this testamentary letter, or it might be something that they have shared with a loved one. So um, you might want to take a, a deeper dive into that one. Um, Another thing you might want to pay attention to is when making an announcement about viewing and things like that, you may want to have a house sitter, somebody who actually comes to the house and stays there while the viewing is going on or the service is going on, just from a protection standpoint. So you might want to take that into consideration. Um, the other thing is you might want to reach out to their other advisors, if they have insurance agents, if they have employers. Um, with a financial advisor, you may want to let them know sooner or later that what has occurred. In particular, you know, with an insurance agent, they may be able to do the research as far as insurance policies that need to be contacted to let them know about the death. But technically, you can't move forward on retitling anything or getting death distributions or things like that until you have a death certificate. And um, it can take a couple of weeks for those to come in. So take that into consideration. The other thing you'll want to find during this time frame is the will. So who have they named as the executor, the personal representative who's going to act on their behalf and take charge of the estate? And you'll want to notify that person if it's not you and um, explain to them what you know and allow them to have access to the deceased information so that they can start putting things together. The other thing that I did was I reached out to, in this case, my father-in-law had worked for Heinz and there was a pension. So I reached out to them and let him let them know um, because mom was receiving a survivor benefit. I also uh, talked to their human resource department because she was receiving health insurance benefits through them so that they could stop all of that. And if they were, um, having any other type of medical insurance through a provider, you'll want to reach out to them. You also um, don't need to necessarily reach out to Medicare because that's going to go through the Social Security office. So that should all be accounted for. You may also want to research to see if they have a safe deposit box. Um, the ideal situation is that somebody knows where the key is or knows what branch that's at, but um, you'll want to investigate that a little bit further. And then the executor is going to want to make the decision if they are going to go it alone. Um, they will have to go to the county courthouse and submit the will for to start the probate process, or if they're going to work with a attorney and the attorney will start all of that for you. The attorney will also be able to account for a tax identification number for the estate if that's something that um, you need to, to process if everything's going through probate. Um, the tax identification number, if you're going it alone, you can actually apply for it through the IRS online. Um, so you can go that direction. Let's see, I've got a checklist here and actually I'm going to try it to this video. Um, I found it very helpful to read through it on a number of occasions myself just to make sure that um, I've accounted for everything. Now, if the deceased lived alone, you're going to want to uh, get into the house, make sure that it's secured. You're also going to want to let the insurance agent know what has occurred. Now, some insurance companies have a limited time frame in which they'll allow the house to go uninhabited. Um, so if, if you think it's gonna be a while before you're able to put the house on the market, um, you may want to have a family member stay in it on a regular basis. They don't like to see the house left empty because um, there can be damage that occurs. You may have a pipe that bursts or a fire that starts or something like that. And if somebody's not going there on a regular basis, um, that can be detrimental. You'll also want to cancel subscriptions. Maybe there were newspaper subscriptions, magazine subscriptions, but now we have the whole world of um, online. So hopefully the individual who may have had an online pre presence may have named a backup successor. For example, with Facebook, you can actually go on and assign a, um, oh, I can't remember what the terminology is, but somebody who can act on your behalf for your web or for your presence on Facebook. So for in my situation, I named one of my sons so that he might be able to go on there and um, 
take control of the site and shut it down if necessary. But um, most individuals do have a listing of their password somewhere. In my case, I actually use LastPass as my password um, manager, and I have given access again to my son who can go on to LastPass and he would have access to everything so that he'd be able to control what was going on with my, um, my digital presence. So that's very important and very different these days. You also want to reach out to utility companies, um, the banks, wherever their accounts are, credit card companies, and have those uh, stopped, um, mortgage payments, those types of things. Now, when it comes to the creditors, you actually have to put out a public notice. Many times that's actually put in a local newspaper so the creditors read that on a regular basis and they will, um, they'll reach out to the estate so that they maybe get paid for their situation. The other place to um, reach out to would be credit bureaus. You want to let them know that the individual has passed away. That's going to freeze the information so that people aren't trying to open up credit cards in the deceased social security number. Um, let's see. Okay. The other thing to take into consideration is sometimes, depending upon who the executor is, is that they may require payment for acting in that capacity, or the attorney may be at, um, acting in that capacity. So um, getting the estate checking account set up as soon as possible, getting benefits from the life insurance process as soon as possible will give you some liquidity to work with the estate. So those are some of the tips. It's it, can be a very cumbersome process. And even someone like me, who I have helped clients through this process, um, I've had loved ones who passed, uh, passed away and tried to help with this process. I have always gone to the aid of an attorney, somebody who specializes in estate planning to help me through this process. Because from an emotional standpoint, there might be things that you forget. Um, and this is something that they do on a day-to-day -day basis. You don't want to hire Susie attorney who specializes in real estate deals because they're not always going to capture everything. You want to go to somebody who that's what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. So hopefully you find some of these tips helpful. Like I said, I'm going to attach this checklist to, um, to this video. But if you've got any questions and you want to reach out to me, please feel free to, uh, to do so. Either a direct message through Facebook, give me a call at 412-346-4655. Um, send me an email at diane at pearsonfinancialplanning.com. But as always, I appreciate you tuning in. And I hope you found this information valuable. If you'd like to share it and you'd like me to invite somebody to join our little, our little um, group here, please let me know and I'll be happy to do so. So I hope you have a great rest of the day. And um, remember those who uh, the, um, those that we celebrate through this Memorial Day weekend who have given their lives for who um, are very special to all of us. Take care.